Welcome to Enterprise Design's Industry Insights, where we identify key topics in the commercial real estate industry. I'm Ann Weston, Director of Design Services. And I'm Jessica Green, Director of Client Services. For this series, we're discussing market trends with Dallas-based commercial real estate professionals. Thank you both for joining us. We're excited to be here. Absolutely, thank you guys for having us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. So for this series, we're focusing on the topic of key issues for tenants and their representation. Hannah, are existing tenants uh, keeping their current square footage or are you seeing an increase or a decrease? So this is a great question. We are seeing tenants decrease their square footage. That said, they're not necessarily lowering occupancy costs. If you had a client that was in a class A building but taking 10,000 square feet, um, we're seeing groups now maybe move into a double class A building but take 6,000 square feet. Um, so, I mean, yes, less square footage, but we're seeing groups move in to nicer spaces, which is interesting. Um, and I mean, that's all just goes back to getting employees back to the office. Um, and then, I mean, I think especially here in Texas, as it is one of the hotter real estate markets, there are certain groups that not only are keeping their existing square footage, but are expanding, but that's a certain industry type. I would say a lot of tech groups that I'm working with are growing pretty quickly and they're taking more square footage. Um, but then you have other types of firms that are okay with not having as much space. Well, and I'd say to, to Hannah's point, really when it comes to square footage, what we're seeing, and, and she was alluding to this, is, is a flight to quality. Right. right. So let's right. say you've got a company that's, that's currently sitting 10,000 feet and they're looking at going to a nicer building. So they were paying $30 a foot and now they're gonna look at a building that's being closer to 40. Nicer building, better feel, helps on keeping employees in the office, helps with retention, helps with recruiting. What they'll do is they'll look at saying, okay, instead of having 10,000 feet, I'm gonna go to 8,000 feet. I'm gonna cut my actual square footage by 20%. I'll raise my occupancy cost by 25%. And overall, I'm still at about the same price on a, on a monthly and annual basis, but I'm creating a better space for my employees. Which is so important for recruiting and retaining talent. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that we absolutely agree with that and we're seeing that ourselves and especially on the design side when we're helping whenever they do have the space kind of making it come to life and stuff but the right. building in itself helps a lot with it that. does it really quality. does right so. and with spec suites as well i know you mentioned you know the quality of the suite you know maybe a little bit better to kind of right. bring people back in and it just makes it easier like if you right. have a brand new spec suite it's easy mm -hmm. to move your stuff the space is basically ready all you have to do is set up your monitors and you're good to go. It's right. a little more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hannah, I agree with you. I definitely appreciate being here in Dallas because the oh, market right. has been great. Oh, it's amazing. We work with brokers in other states and they're like, oh, we're still at home. I'm like, well, I've been in the office for the past like year and a half. <laughs> Not mad about it though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go to the next question and both of you kind of chime in, we've been going. Um, but I'll start with Joel. Uh, what is the trend that tenants are requesting for recruitment and retention? It's a great question. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are gonna play into that. Um, let, let's start with recruitment. So I was reading a really interesting article this morning that was suggesting that, and I don't have the exact numbers, but essentially just below half of the people in the workforce these days are millennials. So it's you know, everything from me, which I would consider to be one of the elder millennials, um, down to someone like Hannah, who is, is, is not on the younger end of the millennial age, but is kind of down to more of the, the, the lower age in that group. I'm technically actually not a millennial. Oh my goodness. I'm also geriatric millennials. And then Are you really not? I didn't know that, okay. No, I'm I Gen, don't, whatever is it? Or Gen or Z, whatever yeah. The next one is. Okay. I'm so glad to feel old today. There's also a new, there's, there's a new one called Alpha too. So Al just I had to go through all the generations oh yesterday. Oh my god! Yeah, so, no, yes. I'm, I'm I'm the cutoff. So <laughs> did not know that. All right. Well, anyways, so as far as recruitment goes, you know, so we're looking at a group of younger individuals that, for a lot of them, is their first time entering into the workforce. Right. And so what they've been used to and what they've seen, whether it is from friends or from the movies or TV or whatever, is they've seen this really exciting, high energy, you know, cool space. Right. 
you know, what, what, what comes to mind would be something like PwC Tower uh, over right off Clyde Warren. We've got an amazing building, highly amenitized, um, highly walkable, not just amenitized in the building, but also amenitized around the area. I mean, you've got restaurants, you've got bars, you've got a park, you've got workout, you've got, you know, fitness classes galore. And so as companies and as our clients are looking at how do we recruit, the first thing they have to do is they have to look at their office space and they have to say, am I going to be able to, when I am looking at, you know, if I'm looking at trying to hire Hannah, is she going to want to walk into a dumpy older building that doesn't have a coffee shop or doesn't have a gym or doesn't have even just a good aesthetic? Right. Am I going to be more likely to get her there or am I going to be more likely to get her in somewhere like PwC's building? where she walks in and from the second she walks in, it, it's grandiose, it's exciting, it's energetic, it's beautiful, it's, it's fun. And so, you know, really the, 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 the first thing, especially for recruiting, is you want something that's highly monetized. Right. And you mentioned walkability, but, you know, I think these days it's not only just walkability, it's convenience. You right. know, Absolutely. with Amazon and all of the other things that have everything at your fingertips, you really want that in the office as right, well. We're so because used to it now. Otherwise, you know, what is going to pull people out of their homes? What is going to pull people out of, you know, right. working from off the beach? Um, you know, you want people <laughs> back into the building. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, th I think, um, you know, we were seeing your typical office, not, not very collaborative. Now we're seeing offices turn into social spaces. So we're getting away from the cubes. We're getting or the tightly packed cubes. Right. Cubes are still around, um, but it's more spacious. It's more lounge style, and they're reflecting their office space as you know an area to come to be social and to have that face to face collaboration. So I think pivoting from the standard like this is your nine to five office, go to your desk, sit down, having those areas where you can come and meet and talk and you know just bounce ideas off of each other, grab lunch. Um, I think that's important. So just making the space gear towards more of a social aspect. I agree, because it just makes it more fun. And right. it's collaborative and like ideas happen right. that way instead of kind of just Pers being yeah, kind I, of a stale exactly. environment, you know, having it. I love going to work and working with all these, all these boys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it definitely makes people invested in their company as well. Mm -hmm. You know, interfacing right. with the people around you, interfacing with leadership. Uh, you know, if you're not visible, what's going to get you to that next step? How are you going to climb that ladder if all you're sitting right. is, you know, behind your desk at home? Right. And I think at the very end of the day, in order to retain and recruit good talent, you have to be known to have a good culture. And having a good culture is partially to do with the office space that you're in. I absolutely agree. And, and, and I would say, and, and we, we've We've looked a lot at, at recruitment, but retention is also obviously incredibly important. And and I believe you just you said something to this, but you know if you've got two employees, you have employee A and employee B, and they're hired on the same day for the same job, and one you say, all right, you're going to go work from home, and the other you say, hey, I want you in the office four days a week. As those people are working and growing in their careers, who's going to be seen by leadership? Who's going to be seen? you know, going out of their way to do more and have the opportunity to be promoted within the company. It, you know, it, retention is important because, you know, the young guys and gals that are getting hired today are not just, you know, entry level or mid-level employees. They're the future of tomorrow. They're our next leaders. And so retention is, is so important and so valuable because you're not just looking to see who can I keep on the hook for the next five years. You're saying, Who's going to be the next CEO? Who's going to be the next CFO? Who's going to be the next, you know, you name it. Who's going to be the person that's going to be stepping into these roles of leadership year over year? And so we, we don't just need a space that's exciting to get people to take the job. We need a space that's exciting to get people to stay at the job, to come in day after day, and to have the opportunities to continue to grow. That's awesome. Absolutely. Well, looking at our next question, um, you know, I think this question is really great. It's what are the biggest challenges you are facing with finding space for your tenant? So with COVID, a lot of sublease space got put on the market. And prior to COVID, I don't think subleases were as attractive. 
But when COVID happened, people were seeing that there were these spaces, a lot of people out of state, but there were these spaces that were plug and play, discounted rate, shorter terms. So those spaces started to go pretty quickly. And then because of that, landlords started to create more spec suites. Um, we've even seen some landlords offer fully furnished spaces. All that to say, those spaces that once were kind of sitting are going so, so, so quickly. So like I'll put a survey together for a client and then by the time they want a tour, two of the spaces are already leased. So I think just the product itself is tough. And I mean, this is mainly for class A space. Class B, it's a little easier, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. But for class A spec suites and nice sublease spaces that are move and ready, it's just like you have to get on those as soon as possible if you want them. Well, yeah, and, 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 and also, you know, because we are coming out of COVID from the last two years and also with the, you know, fun, exciting word of potential recession on the horizon, Beautiful. you have a lot of owners, you have a lot of companies that are looking at space and saying, oh, well, hey, we're sure rates are going to drop. They're, they have to drop. You know, if the economy's not doing good, the rates must drop. But in reality, what we're seeing is, especially in the Class A and, and Trophy product, we're seeing increases in rates still. They're actually up 2% since beginning of COVID. And our clients think that since COVID just happened, they're going to get a discounted rate. And it's just educating them and saying, no, the DFW market is very hot and the rates aren't going down. If anything, mm -hmm. they're going up. Mm -hmm. Do you say it's because of all the companies that are coming here? Yeah, I mean, I just think DFW is a great place to absolutely. do business. And a lot of people are starting to realize that. Um, and I mean, people here are okay with going to the office more so than people in other states. Um, so I think it's a combo of people coming here, but then also people being a little bit more comfortable with going to the office. Yeah, and I think there's also a, a, a part to that that's just pure supply and demand. Right. I mean, look at Weir's Tower. It was 100% leased before it was actually fully delivered. Mm -hmm. When they, I believe, and, and I, I, I may be slightly off of my rates, but when I first uh, talked to Justin Sholkoff, who was, who was developing it, he was telling me they were planning on quoting rates around 46 to 48 triple net. And by the time the building was complete, they were they had rates well in the low 50s. And people were gladly paying them, like we're begging to pay for them. Absolutely. Another mm -hmm. another example, the link. There were groups that that signed. I want to say, 40, some, 48 net, and we had a group that toured it recently, and we were getting quoted 50 to 52 triple net. And so we're continuing to see those increases because the demand's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and when people are willing to pay for it and the good quality that it is. Exactly, so. if people are willing to pay, they'll keep those rates high. Absolutely. And you think, mentioned the Class A and Class AA just kind of flying off the market the way it is. It is you know, we're crazy. seeing a lot of, you know, the Class B and even the Class C buildings mm -hmm. starting to amenitize their buildings the they same way. They have to compete, yeah. Right, they absolutely have to. And, you know, we're seeing a big push with all of those landlords to redo the lobby, amenitize the building, mm -hmm. to entice people but also keep the rates low mm -hmm. um, so that they do they still can compete with right. some of those other class a buildings they're almost competing within themselves on the b level right because right. they the don't want to get up to the a because then they're competing on that so it's kind of finding ways what we can do to help with these class b's that are can be competitive right. but and not right. getting up the rates that are sky yeah, and the class b they're sitting a little bit more than the class a but mm -hmm. once they start amenitizing and updating it'll be a different story so what are the most helpful tools, research, or advice from vendors that play an important role in guiding your clients? I like that question. Yeah, I do too. I really do. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an example. So I had a, a client recently that was looking for furniture. I am not a furniture salesperson. I do not know much about furniture. You can ask my wife. I am about as dumb as they get when it comes to furniture. But what, I, what, what they did for me, this group came in and they said, how can we help you? And I said, well, as I'm talking about what is cost per square foot and we're talking about TI packages and we're talking about you know, what it's gonna cost to actually occupy, when we start talking about furniture, I wanna be able to show them, okay, let's say you know, building out our space is gonna cost $55 a foot, which is a relatively low price given the current state of the market but let's say in a in a in a nice second gen we're updating a few things and we're trying to get a space that's 
almost moving ready across the goal line and, and changing a few things. Um, if we're gonna include furniture in there, what would it cost to have kind of a, a low tier, a mid tier, and a high tier furniture? And so what they did for me was they created a one pager that showed small sample packages of furniture and roughly what the price would be. So at $15 a foot, here's what you can get. At $25 a foot, here's what you can get at $35. And so having really good little you know, one page touch points is huge for us because because you know my, my job is not to understand what's going on in furniture, but I need to know enough to be dangerous or I need to have enough information behind me to be able to show them what they need to see. Right. And for our business, we have to do a lot of prospecting. We're having to constantly um, touch up with existing prospects, people we're chasing. So I think having cool marketing materials that we can also use as touch points as prospecting for our clients is big. Um, and then, I mean, this is something that I'm realizing is more and more important every single day, but just open communication. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you don't have an update, tell me you don't have an update. Just inform me so I can set expectations for my client. The worst is when you're working a deal with somebody and your client's blowing you up and you need an answer and they just go silent because that just gets my client mad at me. Um, so I think communication is huge. Just effectively, efficiently communicating. We don't need to have calls every single day. We don't really even need to have too many calls. Like if there's not an update, just shoot me a quick text. Um, but communication is huge. Yeah, I've heard recently that a lot of just the movement and kind of the fast pace of everything is making stuff start to feel like dating apps where, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden you've just been ghosted. I, and, no, I know. You know <laughs> it's yeah. not great, yeah. but, you know. I, it's terrible. I, yeah. And then like, it, it's a lot. Um, but yeah, just... I need to be able to update my client and I can't update my client if you don't update me. And if I do, I'm going to have to just make something up and I don't have to do that. Exactly. So communication is yeah. huge. We, we love, love communication. I love we do. really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's one of those skills that it seems a little bit more complicated, but then when you realize like if we're touching base, yes. you don't have to tell me exactly what's going on. You can simply say, this is happening don't have anything yet, I'll let you know tomorrow. Right, like high level. Right, exactly. You know, just so that you can, because you're talking to your client and, constantly, and so you want to have, you know, just high level things to tell them. Right, and, and one thing I'm realizing recently is tenants are waiting longer and longer to find the space they need. So then when it is time, it's like crunch time. And they're like, all right, we got to go, we got to go. And I'm like, I've been calling you for three months, but. <laughs> well, and you to that point, you know, fun buzzword that everyone's throwing around right now that is, horrible is, is lead times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, setting expectations. Yeah. Right back to setting expectations. I mean, you know, when we've got some small product that's going into a space that's sitting, you know, back ordered 12 to 16 weeks right now, we need to know that. Right. And, and really, and, and I'd say we need to know that really more, you know, as we're, as we partner with our project development teams and, and are working with our, our PDS crew, really that, that more is, is on their end. But, when we are the single point of contact that's trying to maintain and handle that relationship, you know, having that transparency mm -hmm. and having that just open communication on all ends is, is so valuable for us. Yeah. Even if it's not the best news up front, like it, it's going to take six months to get something, let me know. Absolutely. I feel like sometimes people kind of beat around the bush because they don't want to deliver the bad news, but just deliver the bad news so I can set expectations. Makes my life easier, makes your life easier. Everybody knows the bad news is coming right now. Exactly. I mean, Absolutely. Being transparent is the best thing and be honest with your clients right. so that they're in the right space. Exactly, it just goes hand in hand with communication. So overall, touch points, communication, setting expectations. Love it. Great. Well, looking at our last question, uh, if you could pick three buildings in DFW, that display qualities of forward thinking for tenants, which would you pick? All right, can I reshape your question? Of course. Yes. All right, how about three submarkets? Okay. okay. So let's look at kind of three of the, the big submarkets right now. You've got kind of Frisco Legacy, you've got Uptown, Downtown, and then you've got, let's go with Las Colinas. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's good. So, so for, for Frisco Plano, um, one thing that, so I, work I do a lot of work in Frisco Plano they've done a great job at creating certain building parks so there's Hall Park and there's Granite Park I love working with both of them um, but one thing that's neat about those groups is you know there's 
13 buildings in Hall Park, and if there's a conference room booked in one building, you can go to the other building and use that conference room. Or if you need to book, I don't even know, I don't know. But if there's not a fitness center in your building, you can go to the other building. Um, another thing I like about the building parks is if you have a five-year lease, you're three years into the lease and you realize you need to expand, because there's other buildings in the building park under the same ownership, it's easy to pivot and possibly move into a 10,000 square foot space at the building right across the street. So it's really more of that campus feel exactly. rather than the individual building Exactly. Feel. I think it creates a community. Um, it creates flexibility, which I think is important in today's market. Um, one thing that we're seeing a lot with our clients is they really don't know how big they're going to be. So they're like, I mean, yeah, we'll take 10,000 square feet right now, but I think we're going to be 15 to 20,000 square feet in the next two years. But that, that's tough because like you don't want to take that extra 10,000 square feet, pay on it, and then waste all that money. Um, so just having the flexibility to mm -hmm. kind of pivot when you need to. Yeah. Right. You know, Uptown, I mentioned these earlier, but you know, PwC Tower, or that building is, is just unbelievable when it comes to really having everything people are looking for. It's got restaurants, it's got bars, it's got, you know, fitness center, conference room, it's on the park, great building, highly amenitized. The Link, another really cool option. Uh, when Kaizen uh, Development did that building, you know, they they had a really creative thought in mind. They have a lot of work in, in history and hospitality. And so what they actually did with that building was they added a, on the amenity floor, they added a three bedroom, basically hotel, that's for tenants and tenants guests that can be reserved, which is you know really cool, very, very forward thinking, especially as you have you know, a lot more of a hybrid model. I think that was um, the first group to do that in Dallas. Right? I think so. I mean, there's there's other buildings that have hotel space in their buildings, but right. not not like that. Uh, McKinney and Olive, yeah. our building, it's it, you know, it's you know, Maybe not only is it, it walkable, but you can literally get in and out of Uptown in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. But you also have restaurants that you know you've got you know places for lunch you got places for happy hour soul after work cycle. you got, everything yeah you've got fitness you got yeah. a little bit of everything and then of course up in in las colinas you know williams square is a stunning stunning property and not only have they done a good job with creating that the re really recreating the building but also uh the city of irving i believe just pumped 7.8 million into renovating the park the old with all the Mustangs and it they it had just, a yeah just completed yeah, a grand, grand opening was Friday yeah. mm -hmm. and I mean talk about not just um, building ownership recognizing the value in in wanting to create a space where people want to be but look at a city that wants to back that right. wanting to invest money in in creating space uh, and I'd say you know probably our, our Urban Towers another great op option um, you know you've got you know tons of money that's been pumped into redoing all of the amenities in there from restaurants to gym to all, all common spaces. So. Yeah, the gym in Urban Towers. I, have y'all ever seen it? It's bigger than... <laughs> it might be the biggest gym I've ever seen in the I'm office like, building. I walk in there and I'm like, this is bigger than my gym. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what? yeah. And that's kind of where things are going. It's, you know, things Definitely that are cutting edge, mm -hmm. things that have, you know, all the different things that you can do in a gym. Right. It's uh, funny so. though. I love this outdoor, outdoor activity with oh. these parks. They're being, I mean, it's just amazing. Once like it makes you want to get out there. Oranges are nice. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah that's, that's actually a, a really cool new thing that I've started seeing a lot more is um, indoor outdoor gyms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we saw the Tennyson um, mm -hmm. in Plano yeah. has. The stack has one too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, and then even just having the outdoor tenant lounge to hang out in, the rooftop tenant lounges are big in Dallas. Um, but I mean, it's funny. People want the fitness center in their office, but I hardly ever see anybody in the fitness center <laughs> right. in their office. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it checks the box and you can say you have a fitness center in your office. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I always think it's funny. I never see it's people in it. Also not the fitness, fitness center that buildings used to have where it was like the leftover space in the basement oh, with yeah. no yeah. windows. Mm -hmm. It's prime real estate, yes. you know, on like, the first floor. Oh God, like Lincoln right there Center, when you walk in. Right. No, like Lincoln Center one, two, three. I think it, the new fitness center is in two. Yes. It is crazy. Like the amount of money that ownership is starting to put in the buildings to really amenitize it. I love it. Yeah. It's it, buildings are starting to get super unique here and it's exciting. Well, and that that's why I like the idea instead of looking at three buildings, looking at some submarkets because it's really at this point not just one ownership 
group that's realized they need to start amenitizing and making buildings better, it is becoming, and, and great for our clients, it is becoming a new norm, is that we, it, it's not just that we as the you know, real estate community have recognized that this needs to happen, it's that as a whole it's happening. And so, you know, when you're looking at someone who's worked from home and gotten comfortable over the last two years, the idea of getting them back into an office is not just getting buy-in from us. No. You know, I went home for two weeks when, when COVID hit. Now, partially because my wife said, I love you. <laughs> you talk a lot. He talks a lot. Um, but also because, you know, for what we all do, how are we going to be able to talk to people and say, hey, you should be back in your office? If we're not even back in the yeah. office. We got to sell right. the product. We got to be in the product we're selling. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're not out engaging with people, it's really right. hard to do your job in our industry. Right. It just really is. Yeah. And um, I mean, Hall has some cool stuff coming. They have a new office tower. So does Granite. But the, Hall has a new office tower coming in 2023. And then they have a whole plan to do like a boutique hotel, um, luxury, high-rise residential, um, a community park, a food hall. So there's exciting stuff coming for yes. these different little submarkets. Yeah. It'll be interesting yes. to see how DFW as a whole changes in the next 10 years. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I know, yeah, I love it. It's gonna be really great. We're so. in an amazing area to be doing real estate, yes. especially commercial. Really and I mean, residential's hot right now too. But <laughs> yes. um, no, it, it's a great spot, it really is. We really appreciate y'all. This was yeah. such a great discussion and yeah. so fun and so. Thank you both for taking the time to be Absolutely. on our podcast and video series. And so, yes, yeah. thank you both. Thank We've, you, Hannah. Thank yeah, you, Joel. No, we we really so appreciate fun. you being here. Thank you for tuning in to Enterprise Designs Industry Insights video podcast. Please follow us and subscribe to our channel or visit us on our website at enterprisedesign.com. And look for our teaser video highlighting the next episode. We look forward to seeing you then.